I'm excited by this next topic. We're going to talk about multicellular eukaryotic parasites. We're talking about animals here. So we're talking about organisms that share a lot in common with us. But these organisms are living on us, sucking our blood, or living inside us. So at the end of this topic, maybe you'll share my interest and excitement over these interesting critters, or maybe you simply won't be able to sleep for a week. Parasites that live in our bodies are known as endoparasites, endo meaning inside. They often have a very complex life cycle that involves several different hosts. Ectoparasites live on the body. Ecto means outside. And quite often they're only found there when they're actually feeding. So things like leeches would be ectoparasites and a number of arthropods, mites, ticks, and insects like mosquitoes and lice. Now these can also serve as important vectors for other pathogens. So ticks, for instance, will transmit the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. Multicellular animal parasites include a number of worms. Now worm is kind of an informal word in biology. It just means an invertebrate that's longer than it is wide, essentially. We have platyhelminthes, which are flatworms. Platy means flat, helminthes means worm. And then we have the nematodes, which are unsegmented worms that are round in cross-section. We have the annelida, which aren't internal parasites. The only group we're talking about here that can parasitize us would be leeches, and those are ectoparasites. There's a number of arthropods that can be ectoparasites, a number of different insects, and then also mites and ticks, like the tick that you see here. Let's take a look at those helminthes, or worms, in more detail. First of all, we have the flatworms, and this group is made up of two subgroups. We have the cestoidea, which are the tapeworms. They're incredibly flat. They're almost paper thin. They're going to be living within the intestine and soaking up that food that you've already digested for them. And then we have the trematodes, or flukes, which contain a number of different species that live throughout different organs of your body, as we'll see. Next, we have the nematodes, and a good example of this would be Ascaris, which is a roundworm that infects more than 1.5 billion people throughout the world, and it lives in the intestine. But we have other nematode examples as well that we'll look at. And then we have the annelids, and these are almost not worth mentioning, but I'll just throw them in here as well. These are the leeches, and leeches, of course, are ectoparasites that draw blood from your body. Tapeworms are cestodiae. That is the plural form for members of the class cestoda. Members of this animal class have very complex life cycles and they're all parasitic. They can have multiple hosts and humans can be a definitive host or an intermediate host for a tapeworm, depending on what species we're talking about. The definitive host is the location where the parasite reaches maturity and reproduces sexually. The intermediate host is going to contain the immature larval form of the parasite. The tapeworms that cause humans problems belong to the genus Tinea. And if you have a tapeworm infection, you have Taniasis. As mentioned, tapeworms have a very complex life cycle and humans can be an intermediate host or a definitive host or for some species, they can be either one. Let's take a look at the two really important species when it comes to humans. We have the beef tapeworm. And don't worry about the Latin name, beef tapeworm is fine. For this particular species, humans can be the definitive host, but they can't be the intermediate host. As you'll see, parasites can be very picky when it comes to who or what they're going to live in. So if you have an infection with the beef tapeworm, that means that you have the adult, sexually mature, sexually active form of the worm living in your intestine. It's having sex with itself typically, and it's producing fertilized eggs or zygotes that are gonna be passed in your feces. The cow can contain the larval stage, 
and the larval stage doesn't reproduce. The larval stage is going to form a cyst within the muscle. So it coats itself in this tough cyst, which will help protect it from the cow's immune system and also will protect it if you eat it and it has to pass through your stomach. So let's say that you eat some beef that contains these encysted larvae and you don't cook the beef or freeze the beef. So that live larval stage will pass through the stomach and then it will break out of that cyst in your intestine, give rise to the sexually mature adult and complete the life cycle. For the pork tapeworm, we can be either an intermediate host or a definitive host. In fact, it's possible that you could be both at the same time. So if you're the definitive host, then it's just like the beef tapeworm, you're gonna have the adult sexually mature form in your intestine. If you have the larval form, that would make you the intermediate host and the larva will be forming cysts within your muscle or perhaps within your nervous tissue or even within your eyes. And this is a condition known as cystocercosis. Let's take a look at the beef tapeworm life cycle. What you're seeing in the photograph here is something known as beef measle. And what this is, is it's an encapsulated baby tapeworm. So we have the larval tapeworm here and it's walled itself off by forming this cyst to protect itself from the cow's immune system. However, fluid can still seep into that space and the worm is feeding on that uh, juice. Now, if you were to look at a piece of meat that contains the larva and you know what you're looking for, you can see these, they're about the size of a grain of rice. And I wanna point out that this is something that's carefully monitored in all developed countries at all meat processing plants. So it's very unlikely that you would encounter this in a first world country, although it can happen. And I'll talk about an example of that. If you're worried about this, of course, the easy way to kill these things is to simply cook the meat. So long as you get the meat up above 56 degrees, that will kill the worm. Or you can freeze the meat. If you freeze it thoroughly, that will also kill the worm. But let's say that you haven't done that and you do have contaminated meat, then what's gonna happen is those cysts will pass through the stomach this tough coating will allow them to survive the stomach acid, and then they'll germinate, so to speak, within the small intestine. So the little larva will break out and it will grow to adulthood and become sexually mature within your intestine. Tapeworms are egg making machines. That's pretty much all they do. At one end, they have something known as a scolex. And we can see that up here. The scolex contains suction cups and also hooks that are used to attach to the inside of your intestine. But the rest of the animal is dedicated entirely to reproduction. We have these segments known as proglottids. Each segment contains male and female reproductive structures. So we have sperm being produced within these proglottids and fertilizing eggs within the same animal typically, although we can have uh, sex between two worms if you have two or more in your intestine. The proglottids will fill up with these fertilized eggs. And the mature proglottids will break off of the end of the animal and they'll be passed in your feces. So the eggs at this point are not technically eggs, they're actually embryonated eggs, which means they already contain a partially developed little larva. But those embryonated eggs may end up on some grass or other vegetation that might be eaten by a cow. And if the cow eats it, well, that little developing larva is gonna burrow through the wall of its intestine, find a blood vessel, follow that blood vessel somewhere, and then the larva will find a nice little cozy place to insist within the flesh of the cow. Let's have a look at the anatomy of a typical tapeworm. Now the tapeworm at the top here has a rather noticeable scolex. That's this bit at the anterior end. And you might be thinking that these structures here are eyes. Well, they're not actually. Those are just suction cups that are used for attachment. There are no eyes in a tapeworm. It doesn't need them. It's living in the dark. It presumably evolved from a worm 
that had structures we normally associate with the head of an animal, but it's lost them. It has no eyes. It also has no mouth. Doesn't need it. It's living in pre-digested food. It's just going to soak up nutrients through its skin. It doesn't have a digestive system. It doesn't have a nervous system. It really doesn't have any systems at all, except for the structures that are used for reproduction. Those segments are known as proglottids. So you can see some segments down here. Again, these are proglottids, and I'm not drawing that line very well, but that would be a proglottid. Notice further down, the proglottids are much larger. So new proglottids are going to start developing right up here, right at the base of the scolex, and then those proglottids will mature as they move away from the scolex. So new segments are added just below the scolex, and then the segments move down, get larger, and develop reproductive structures. On the bottom here, you're seeing another worm with a very small scolex here that's used for attachment. And once again, the proglottids are going to start developing there. They're going to move away from the scolex and develop and mature. Um, and then when we're down around here, they're going to be fertilized. And those eggs will become embryonated, and then eventually those proglottids will be shed from the end of the animal. At this point, those proglottids contain a million or more embryonated eggs. So the little larva has already started developing in each of those embryonated eggs. Now the link at the bottom there is something you might want to check out if you have a strong stomach. It's an interesting story about a fellow that went into a French restaurant and picked up his own tapeworm. Um, he ate some steak tartare, which is raw meat, and that contained some of these larvae. And one of them germinated and grew into a fully formed tapeworm with his, in his intestine. Now, quite often, if you get a tapeworm and you just have the one or maybe two, you might not realize you have a tapeworm. If you have a very slight infection, they tend not to cause major concerns. However, how most people find out is you start to release these proglottids. So you might see something that looks like little bits of linguine, but you didn't eat any uh, linguine. That's how he found out. Getting rid of a tapeworm is actually quite easy. We'll talk about that more when we talk about pharmaceuticals, but there are drugs you can take which will essentially paralyze the tapeworm. And then you have to pass the tapeworm. He goes into great detail about how he passed his tapeworm in a public restroom. Anyway, it's really quite interesting to read. Uh, you might want to check out the message board as well. As I recall, there's lots of interesting stories that people share on that message board about their own parasite encounters. Here's a closer look at the scolex of a tapeworm. The scolex has hooks and suckers, and the different species can be identified by the arrangement of those hooks and suckers. I've put head in quotes because it's not really a head. We don't have a mouth, we don't have eyes, we don't have a brain, we don't have any sense organs whatsoever, we don't have any of the things that we would normally associate with the head of an animal. Proglottids are going to first develop underneath the scolex, and as a new one is added, it will push the other ones towards the posterior of the animal. As the proglottids move posteriorly, they're going to develop and mature, and the eggs they contain will be fertilized. Here's a closer look at one of those proglottids. We've got an ovary that produces eggs. We've got testes that produce sperm. We've got a uterus and an opening to the outside of the proglottid that can conduct those sperm, and that's all there is. It's all reproductive stuff. And this same structure is repeated over and over again in each of the proglottids. So tapeworms are hermaphrodites. And if you told a tapeworm to go itself, it actually could. So sperm is produced by one proglottid and it swims to an adjacent proglottid that may or may not be on the same animal. It depends how many tapeworms you have. The sperm is going to swim into the uterus, it will meet up with eggs there and fertilize them. And here's one last look at the scolex from a few different species just to give you some nightmares.
you might have heard the urban legend or rumors that people will take tapeworm eggs as part of their diet plan. So the idea is you get an adult tapeworm and you can eat whatever you want and it will eat some of it for you. Now, if you're paying attention, you might have realized why this wouldn't work. If you eat a tapeworm egg, you don't get the adult, you get the larva. And the larva is gonna be insisted somewhere in your body. And as we'll see, you don't want the larva. You don't necessarily want the adult either, but you definitely don't want the larva. So we've got an old ad here from the 1920s, I believe, uh, for sanitized tapeworms. And apparently they're easy to swallow as well. Well, if they're eggs, they're not gonna give you what you want. If they're insisted larva, I guess that would work, but it's unlikely that an insisted larva is going to survive being put into a pill form or being dried out. They're rather delicate. It may be a year or more before you know you've picked up a tapeworm, but they can get quite long, as you see here. But just be glad you're not a fish. Believe it or not, this tapeworm came out of this fish. So far, we've been focusing on the beef tapeworm. And remember that humans can only be the definitive host for a beef tapeworm. We can't be an intermediate host. So if you have a beef tapeworm, that means that you have the sexually mature adult living in your intestine. But let's take a look at what happens if you become an intermediate host. Well, remember that if you have a type of tapeworm that can cause that sort of infection, you're going to end up with these insisted larvae living within your tissues, usually within the meat, the muscle of your body, but these cysts can pop up other places as well. Pigs and humans share a lot in common. One of the things we share in common is that we can both be either the intermediate or definitive host for the pork tapeworm. Let's start with a situation where the pig is the intermediate host. Remember that means that the pig has insisted tapeworm larva living within its tissues. So someone eats some undercooked pork from an infected animal, what's gonna happen is those larvae are gonna turn into adult, sexually mature tapeworms within that person's intestine. Okay, now let's look at the situation where the pig is the definitive host. If the pig is the definitive host, that means it has an adult tapeworm living in its intestine, shedding embryonated eggs into the feces. In many parts of the world, it's very common to use animal manure and also human waste to fertilize crops. So imagine you're using some of that untreated pig manure to fertilize your vegetables. You eat some of those vegetables, but you don't wash them sufficiently and you end up ingesting some of these embryonated eggs. If that's the case, then you will become the intermediate host. Now, we could also have a situation where the pigs and the humans are constantly reinfecting themselves because of course, if the human was the definitive host, it's going to be producing feces that contain eggs. And if that spread on the crops as well, and those are fed to the pigs, then this could be an ongoing cycle. And we could have a situation on a poorly run farm where the pigs and the humans are riddled with pork tapeworm. They could have both the larval form and the adult form in the same individual. And you really don't want to be an intermediate host. If you have a choice, I can't imagine why you would, but if someone is pointing a gun at your head and offering you a plate of contaminated meat or some veggies that have uh, feces on them, take the contaminated meat because the cysts that form can do a lot of damage to your body. So you're seeing here some x-rays of people that have these larvae living within them. So on the bottom uh, left, you can see someone's knee and you can see all those little things that look like grains of rice. Well, those are larvae that are insisted within the muscle. In the photograph on the right, you're seeing an x-ray of someone's pelvis. And again, we got all these little white grains of rice. Those are insisted larvae. 
And you can imagine if you have a really heavy parasite load, this could do significant damage to your tissues. The cysts can potentially form anywhere in your body. There are stories of people that have cysts forming within their eye and they have this blurry spot in their vision and it's due to a little worm that's floating around in a cyst in the vitreous humor of the eye. Worse yet, you can have these cysts forming within the brain. You're seeing a scan on the left of someone who has a very bad infection of the brain and you can see it's doing a lot of damage to the brain. On the right, you're seeing a post-mortem image of a person that died from one of these infections. Each one of those bubbles contains a little larval worm. And people that come into the hospital with these infections are going to be acting strangely, of course, because of the damage to the brain. And, you know, pork tapeworm larva is not necessarily going to be your immediate diagnosis. It can take a while sometimes to realize exactly what's going on in these individuals. And I should point out that although I've spent quite a bit of time on the pork and beef tapeworms, there are a number of other tapeworm species that can potentially infect humans. There are some, for instance, that infect marine fish, and the definitive host would normally be some sort of marine mammal, like a seal, for instance, but instead they occasionally infect humans. You're seeing an example of that here, and this isn't one that I expect you to know about necessarily. I just want to point out how complex these life cycles can be. So here we have a larval stage that's going to live within a tiny little microscopic crustacean, and it develops within the crustacean, and then that crustacean is eaten by a fish, and it takes on a new form once it's in the fish that's more recognizable as a larval tapeworm. And then this can be passed from fish to fish and eventually passed to humans. And then the human, of course, can become the definitive host. Furry family members can also get tapeworms, of course. And the most common tapeworm that we see in cats and dogs is spread by a flea. The flea acts as the intermediate host. So what happens is the dog will have the adult sexually mature tapeworm they'll be releasing eggs into their feces and of course dogs aren't necessarily the cleanest animals and let's say there's a little bit of that feces with some eggs in it within their bedding well that might be eaten by fleas that are living in their bedding and the fleas will take up those eggs they develop the larval form within them and then if you've got a dog that's got fleas, it's going to be biting at itself and trying to catch those fleas. And if it eats one, well, that's going to complete the life cycle. They're going to take up the larva. So if you have a problem with tapeworms with your dogs, one of the things to try to manage is the fleas. Get rid of the fleas, then you can get rid of the adult tapeworm and you will have broken this cycle. And I've got one more example that might be of interest to any hunters out there. Wild animals are riddled with parasites. I mean, that's the norm. We're quite lucky living in this day and age in this location in that we don't have, usually, a whole lot of parasites. But that's unusual. Most creatures have lots of parasites that are living in them or on them. So a deer, for instance, will have a lot of external and internal parasites, and most of them aren't really anything to worry about. But let's say that you're a hunter and you kill a deer, and that deer contains larva. So the deer in this particular life cycle for this species that I'm showing is an intermediate host. Well, you could actually eat that meat without any concern. I don't suggest you eat it uncooked. But if you didn't take any effort to cook it or freeze it and you ate that meat, those larvae won't actually germinate in your body. They're not going to give rise to adult tapeworms. This is a tapeworm that's really picky and it will only mature within a carnivore, specifically wolves or sometimes foxes. But let's say that you have a wolf at home. You have a dog, which is essentially a wolf. And let's say that you feed that dog raw deer meat. Well, that dog can become a definitive host. And now that dog, of course, is going to be 
pooping out eggs. And what's interesting about this specific tapeworm is although humans can't be a definitive host, they can be an intermediate host. So imagine the situation where you're a hunter, you kill a deer, it's got infected meat, so it's got larva in it. You feed that meat uncooked or untreated to your dog, and then your dog develops a tapeworm. It starts pooping out tapeworm eggs. It licks its butt and then licks your mouth. Now you could become an intermediate host, so something to be careful about. Okay, let's move on to something that's equally as unpleasant. Flukes, or trematodes. Trematodes are flatworms. They have a flat leaf-like shape to them. Some of them look almost like leeches, but these are internal parasites. They're more complex than the cestoidea. They're more complex than tapeworms. They have organ systems. As you can see, they actually have a digestive system. They have localized ovaries and testes, so they don't have segmentation. They also are surrounded by a cuticle. This is a covering outside of the epidermis that helps protect them from the immune system, for instance. Flukes can differ greatly in their appearance, their preference for host species, and also what part of the body they inhabit when they're in a host. It depends on the species. Let's start with an example. Let's look at the human liver fluke. So for this particular species, humans can be a definitive host. So we have the mature, sexually active adult living within the human, specifically within the canals that conduct bile from the liver to the bile duct and from the bile duct to the duodenum of the small intestine. So they're getting it on in these ducts. They're producing embryonated eggs, and those eggs are gonna be passed into the intestine and then shed in the feces. In many parts of the world, sewage treatment is not what it should be. It's non-existent in many areas. And if raw, untreated sewage gets into a waterway, those embryonic, embryonated sorry, eggs are going to continue their development into larva. There's several larval stages, and I don't expect you to know all of these, but realize that there are a few that are free swimming. The first one, the Myricidia, is a free swimming larva that's covered in cilia. It swims through the water and it seeks out a snail. It burrows through the flesh of the snail. Once inside the snail, it is going to reproduce asexually inside the snail. It goes through several different stages in different parts of the snail, but eventually it's going to produce these free swimming larvae called cercaria that leave the snail. Because we had asexual reproduction in the snail, there's more larva leaving than came in. This new larva is going to seek out a fish and it's going to burrow into the flesh of the fish. Now, if something eats that fish that is a suitable definitive host, such as another human, then we get further development. That larva is going to exist or exit the cyst within the duodenum. It's going to travel back to the bile duct and continue the life cycle. These liver flukes are especially common in parts of Asia. And as you might expect, they do some damage to the liver and they interrupt the functioning of the liver and the small intestine. Remember that one of the things the liver does, it does a lot of things, but one of the things it does is to break down and recycle hemoglobin. If it can't do that, the intermediates of this breakdown will accumulate within the skin and the sclera of the eyes, and that brings about this yellowish decoloration known as jaundice. Liver flukes often infect ruminants. Those are animals that chew their cud, they ruminate, they basically bring up half digested food into their mouth, chew it again, and that goes back down into their multi-chambered stomach. But the more important thing I want you to note is that this life cycle almost always includes a snail. So for all of these flukes, a snail is an intermediate host. Now the snail is being infected by this parasite as well. I don't want to give snails a bad name. They're pretty cool. But if you are in an area 
where flukes are common and you are drinking from a water source where there are lots of snails, you might want to reconsider that. Here you're seeing a section of liver from a white-tailed deer. And this section of liver contains two flukes. One of them has been popped out of the tissue. So notice that the flukes have surrounded themselves in a very tough capsule to try and protect themselves from the white-tailed deer's immune system. The immune system contains eosinophils, which are specialized white blood cells that specifically attack parasites. And the liver itself has tried to wall itself off as well. Here you're seeing the liver of a moose and you're seeing the damage that's been done by a very, very heavy fluke infestation. So the flukes can damage a lot of tissue. The liver is a pretty darn important organ. And if a lot of that tissue is lost, of course, that's going to greatly impact the health of the animal. There are so many fascinating flukes out there. It's hard to pick just a few to talk about, but let's move on to another example, the human lung fluke. Guess where this guy lives? Notice that the life cycle once again includes a snail. So let's start with our fisherman here. Our fisherman, unfortunately, has a lung fluke. So he has these worms that are living within his lungs and having sex within his lungs and producing fertilized eggs. He's going to cough those up and then swallow them and they're going to pass through the digestive tract and be shed with feces. If his feces end up in the water, then those embryonated eggs will develop into a free swimming larva. Just like we saw before, this larva is covered in cilia. It will swim around until it bumps into a snail and then it will burrow into the flesh of the snail. Once in the snail, it'll go through a few different stages and it will reproduce asexually. The next thing that happens is we have a second free swimming larva and a whole bunch of those are gonna burrow out of the snail and seek out a crustacean, a large crustacean like a crayfish and they burrow into the crayfish. And then that crayfish can be eaten by another definitive host, such as another human. Okay, let's do another one. Let's take a look at blood flukes. Blood flukes that infect humans belong to the genus Schistosoma, and there's several different species. The human is the definitive host, and depending on the species, the eggs can be shed in the feces or in the urine. Once again, there is going to be a larval stage that will parasitize and reproduce asexually within snails. Blood flukes, as the name suggests, inhabit the bloodstream. Typically, they will seek out a very large blood vessel with lots of blood flow that will bring them lots of food and oxygen. They'll stay put within that blood vessel using suction cups. So they are going to stick to the inside of a large blood vessel and the males and females associate with each other for life. They're monogamous. It's kind of sweet. There are several different species and they have different preferences. And on this diagram, you're seeing the preferences of three species, A, B, and C. So they might live in blood vessels that are closely associated with the intestine or blood vessels that are very closely associated with the bladder where they are is going to dictate where the eggs end up. They might end up in the feces or they might end up in the urine. If those embryonated eggs find their way to a fresh water source, then what's gonna happen is they're going to develop into a free swimming larva. And once again, this is a ciliated larva that will seek out a snail. It'll penetrate the tissue of the snail. And once again, we have asexual reproduction to amplify the number of parasites within the snail. We have a second free swimming larva that's gonna leave. Again, this is a cercariae, don't worry about the name, but this is the larva that's going to infect the human. But this last step is a little different from the last two examples we looked at. Humans aren't going to ingest this larva. Instead, if you're wading in the water or going for a swim, these little microscopic larvae can burrow through your skin. 
they'll burrow through your skin until they find a capillary. They will follow your bloodstream until they find their preferred location, and then they will stick to the inside of that blood vessel and stay put. Now imagine that you're a blood fluke. You've managed to find a host, and you've managed to find your way to your preferred location within that host. And in all probability, that's going to be a major artery, like the hepatic artery, for instance. Every time the host's heart beats, there's going to be this powerful wave of blood washing over you, and it's all you can do to hang on and stay in place. Now imagine against all odds, you've also managed to find a mate. Well, how are you going to hang on to each other? And how are you going to go about having sex in that kind of environment? Blood flukes have an interesting strategy to deal with this. On the right, you're seeing a male blood fluke. And on the left, you're seeing a female blood fluke. The male is kind of fat. The female, quite slender. Also note, that the male has these two very pronounced suction cups that it can use to stick to the inside of that artery. The female does not, but the male has a groove that runs the entire length of his body. And if a female and a male happen to encounter each other, the female is gonna crawl into that groove like this and she's going to stay put in that groove. The male is going to hang on for dear life, and the female will stay put. It looks something like this. So for the rest of their lives, these two worms will be embraced. They're going to be cuddling and having sex until they die. That's kind of romantic. Okay, we have to do one more. And this time, let's take a look at a species that's actually found in Canada. This is a species of blood fluke that normally infects ducks. Ducks are the definitive host. So we have the adults living within the bloodstream of the duck. They're producing embryonated eggs that will be passed in the feces. And as we've seen before, if they find water, which they're likely to do if they're coming out of a duck, they will develop into a free swimming larva. That free swimming larva will seek out a snail once again, reproduce asexually within the snail, and produce a second free swimming larva. Normally, that larva would seek out a duck. It would burrow through the skin of the foot of the duck, get to a blood vessel, and complete the life cycle. However, this second larva can also mistake humans for a definitive host and burrow into the skin of the human. But the human is not a suitable host. So what happens is this larva dies within the skin. Your immune system attacks it and your body breaks it down. Now for most people, this isn't a huge problem you might not experience anything, or it might make you rather itchy. But for some people, this immune response is overblown and they have a severe allergic reaction. Now, in a case like this, humans are not considered the definitive host because the parasite can't survive in us. We are considered an accidental host. So the issue here isn't one of an ongoing infection, because this organism is gonna die within a few hours of penetrating your skin, the issue here is how violently your body might respond to this misplaced would-be parasite. So for instance, when I was a child in Ontario, my parents had a cottage and we would swim in the lake quite often. This is something that bothered my father quite a bit, although he never had the kind of results that you see in these photos, but he would get quite itchy. I didn't notice it at all. My advice is if you're swimming in a lake and you're concerned about this, stick to open water. What quite often will happen is if there's a lot of these little microscopic critters, the wind will basically gather them up into bays and you'll find kind of stagnant little bays to be rather bad areas to swim in. I had a friend in Alberta 
who made a rather poor choice and she swam in a little pond on a farm water was a bit stagnant it was full of snails and she had a severe allergic reaction she came out of the water she was beet red and she went into anaphylactic shock and collapsed so this can be a serious thing so are you afraid of the world around you yet or do you find this stuff rather interesting i'm hoping it's the latter don't be afraid okay let's move on to nematodes nematodes are unsegmented roundworms so if you were to take a section through a nematode it would be round in cross section they don't have segments they don't have proglottids like we saw in the tapeworms for instance and they don't have true segments like we see in the analyta which we will talk about eventually they have a smooth outer surface and they're covered in an exoskeleton in fact they're thought to be related to insects distantly they have this cuticle that surrounds them and protects them and when they grow they shed that the same way that a snake might shed its skin there are lots of species 90,000 that we know of there's probably a lot more than that the vast majority are free living they're not parasitic and the vast majority are microscopic if you take a sample of pond water or you take a sample of soil it's teeming with nematodes the vast majority are feeding on debris and breaking it down and recycling stuff there are some larger ones and they can actually be up to a meter in size the larger ones are parasitic there are a number of nematodes that we could potentially talk about but i'm going to limit myself to these three species first of all we have pinworms which are tiny little worms and they are found in Canada they don't cause any damage or danger typically they're more of an inconvenience and of course they gross people out then we have Ascaris and hookworm these guys are more problematic and as you can see they infect a lot of people and in fact these numbers are rather conservative Ascaris and hookworm are found in many tropical regions and subtropical regions. And both of these are soil borne parasites. What that means is you get them from the soil. Now, up to this point, if you're maybe a vegan or a vegetarian, you might be thinking, I don't need to worry about worms. I don't eat meat. I hate to disappoint you, but the species that we're looking at here have absolutely nothing to do with meat consumption let's start by looking at pinworms and yes you are seeing what you think you're seeing sorry to throw that in your face pinworms are small worms they live in the colon and they feed on nutrients within the colon so they're not sucking blood or anything like that they're feeding on material within the colon and rectum and then at night the females will migrate out to the surface of the anus and lay their eggs Pinworms are said to have a direct life cycle. Direct refers to the fact that there's no intermediate host. If we're dealing with a parasite that has a definitive host and an intermediate host, that would be an indirect life cycle. So we have this parasite living within the colon. Females are going to migrate to the anus and lay eggs. Now, if you have pinworms, your rectum and anus becomes rather itchy and what might happen is you might scratch that area pick up some feces and eggs under your fingernails and then end up ingesting those eggs when you're eating you might pass those eggs on to another individual and it could be spread by a fomite of some sort as you might imagine pinworms are far more common in children because well let's face it children are a bit disgusting their hygiene is not the greatest when it does pop up in adults it's usually because they picked it up from children so it's more commonly seen in adults that work in nursery schools and so on hookworms are small nematodes that live within the small intestine there is no intermediate host so within the intestine they're going to have sex there's male and female worms and then embryonated eggs are going to leave with the feces now unlike tapeworms 
they're not feeding on pre-digested food within the intestine. Instead, as you can see in the photograph, they have these sharp blade-like structures within the mouth that are used to cut the lining of the intestine and make it bleed, and then they feed off of the blood. The eggs that leave, if they end up in damp soil, will give rise to larva. Once again, proper sanitation is really important when it comes to controlling the spread of this parasite. In many parts of the world where raw sewage is dumped into waterways, beaches, uh, damp sand and soil will contain lots of these little larvae. If you walk along a beach like that, the larva will burrow into the skin of your foot, find a capillary, follow the bloodstream to your lungs, and once they get to your lungs, what they will do is they will enter into an alveolus. You cough up these little worms, you swallow them, and that's how they get back to the intestine. These used to be a big problem in the southern US. Not so much anymore, but they still continue to be a big problem in many tropical and subtropical regions. Trichinella is sometimes referred to as pork worm, but don't get it confused with pork tapeworm. They are very different animals and they do have a different life cycle. So let's take a look at what happens in the pig. Within the pig, we can have adult worms that are living within the intestinal wall of the pig. They're mating and they're producing embryonated eggs that develop into larva. The larva will burrow through the wall of the intestine and will form cysts within the meat, within the muscle of the pig. So this is all happening within the same individual. Now let's imagine that you have some pigs and you slaughter them and there's bits of meat that you're not interested in and you grind them up and you feed them back to other pigs. Well, those pigs can pick up the larva. The larva can turn into adults within the intestine and then this cycle continues. Now we could also, of course, have humans that are eating undercooked infected pork and then the same sort of cycle can occur within the human as well. You might have noticed now that we've talked about a few parasites that infect pigs. I don't want to give you the sense that pigs are dirty animals for that reason, but this probably is why a lot of religions and different cultures have made it taboo to eat pork. I don't mean to suggest that pigs are more likely to get parasites over other farm animals. If anything, it might be slightly more likely for disease and parasites to pass between pigs and humans because we have similar biology. Uh, we have similar diets, for instance. But whenever we're growing plants or animals, we just need to be very careful and consider these pathways. Okay, let's move on to something else. Let's move on to Ascaris. This is a parasite that has a direct life cycle. There is no intermediate host. So once again, we're dealing with a parasite that's not going to be transferred through meat in any way. This is a soil-borne parasite. You pick it up from the soil. So this is something that will live in the intestines of a human potentially, and there are other hosts as well. But if it's living in a human, then it's going to produce embryonated eggs that will pass through the feces and may end up on a farmyard, for instance. If we're using human feces as manure, as fertilizer, then this could end up contaminating crop plants. So imagine we have a person that has these worms living inside of them. If they've only got one worm, then they're gonna pass unfertilized eggs they're not going to develop. But if we have at least one male and one female, then we may get embryonated eggs that are passed to the soil. Once in the soil, that embryo will develop into a little larval worm. Now let's say that you eat some plants, some fruits or vegetables that have been contaminated with this soil. You're gonna pick up some of those eggs and these eggs are really, really resistant. They'll pass through the stomach and then when they get to the intestine, they will break open and release that little worm. Now the worm 
you might think would just stay put, but it doesn't. This is interesting. It burrows through the lining of the small intestine to a blood vessel, follows the blood vessels to the respiratory system, breaks out into the alveoli of the lungs, you cough it up, you swallow it again, and the second time it gets to the intestine, it stays put. The cuticle that surrounds the worm protects it through its second pass through the stomach. Now, why might it do this? Well, it appears that it evolved from something very similar to a hookworm. And remember that a hookworm is going to burrow through the skin into the bloodstream, follow that to the lungs, be coughed up and swallowed and so on. So it's changed its migration patterns slightly. It now does this second trip through the stomach. Now, the reason this is important is because if you get a lot of these in your system, they can cause problems in your lungs as well. You can have a whole bunch of the little larval worms wriggling around in your alveoli. And I've actually read some disturbing tales of people that went into a hospital feeling things crawling in their chest. And doctors quite often would uh, assume that this person had gone mad, they'd gone crazy. But it was actually due to thousands of worms wriggling around in their lungs. This, as you might imagine, can cause extra damage. Um, it can cause pneumonia, for instance, where the tissues of the lung produce a lot of fluid and you have a difficult time breathing. Unlike other nematodes, Ascaris is quite large. If you have just one or maybe a couple, you might not notice. It might not cause any symptoms. If you have a few, it can cause diarrhea. If you have a lot, it can be very serious. It can block the intestine, which is very painful and can potentially be fatal. In a case like that, it might be necessary to perform surgery to remove those worms. There are some really interesting videos of that on YouTube. I invite you to go to YouTube and type in Ascaris. Uh, I won't be responsible for what you see. Also note, if you do surf around on YouTube and look at videos of parasites, realize that there's a lot of misinformation about parasites. So take the descriptions and so on with a grain of salt. And maybe now you can actually correct people that are posting there. If you ever have need to sex these worms, the male has a slight hook to it, as you can see, but otherwise the male and female look quite similar from the outside. As we've discussed before, the larvae do migrate up through the lungs and that can cause further issues that can cause pneumonia. In this diagram here, you're seeing a very severe infestation of these worms. In a case like this, it will cause serious blockage. Down the bottom, you're seeing the anatomy of one of these worms. They are rather complex multicellular animals. You can see that they have a digestive system. They have a rudimentary nervous system and they have very large gonads. So like all other parasites, reproduction is their main concern. But they don't have any segments and they do have this cuticle around the outside to protect them. Hmm, maybe I should have warned you first. There are some really gross pictures coming up. These are Ascaris. These worms, like I said, are pretty large. They look like noodles. And if you do have the stomach to go on YouTube and search up some of these videos, you'll see that they're pulling masses of these out of the intestines of heavily infected people, and it looks like a writhing bowl of noodles. It's rather disturbing. The other thing that's rather disturbing is if a person with an infection of these worms is put under anesthetic, the worms will quite often panic, so to speak, and they will look for an opening and they will leave the body. What you're seeing here is a jar of preserved worms that was collected at a clinic in um, Bangladesh in a single day. In some parts of the world, this is a serious problem. Because these are soil-borne uh, parasites, they're far more common in children. Children play in the dirt, you know, they bring their fingers to their mouth. 
they get these eggs and children can get very, very serious infections, which unfortunately in many cases can be fatal. More disturbing images coming. But hey, you guys are studying to be nurses, right? You need to get used to the gross stuff. Okay, let's start off easy. And if you're squeamish, you might wanna fast forward. Here's a ball of Ascaris that's been removed from an intestine. And here what you're seeing is the intestine of a pig. And as you can see, the intestine's been broken open to reveal these Ascaris lumbricoides. And you can see that these would have completely blocked the intestine of that pig. Okay, warning, the next image is quite disturbing. In the top image, we're seeing a child that has a high fever. They came into a hospital with a very high fever, and this actually caused the worms to migrate. They will migrate out of the body. They will try to leave the body. They can come up into the mouth, come up into the nose, and may quite disturb and surprise the attending physicians and nurses. At the bottom there, you're seeing a child with a severe infection that was given an anti-helminthase medication. That's a medication that will kill the worms or paralyze the worms so that they can leave the body. Now, with an infestation of this magnitude, generally what they would do is they would go in and operate because, of course, if they give the patient medicine that paralyzes the worms, if there's that many of them, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will be passed without incident. Okay, hopefully you're still hanging in there because we've got some more worms to look at. The guinea worm. This is a worm that in its adult form lives just under the skin and you're seeing one being removed here. So what's happening is the worm is being wrapped around a stick quite often a match stick, and that's being rolled very slowly. The worm is being wrapped around it and carefully removed from the foot. You have to be very careful doing this because you don't want that worm to rupture. That can cause some rather serious bacterial infections. This is a worm that's a big problem in Africa. Now, what's interesting about this worm is it probably gave us one of our best known medical symbols. You've no doubt seen the caduceus numerous times before. It consists of two serpents wrapped around a staff and there's other derivatives of this. This symbol goes back to ancient Greece. So it's thousands of years old and it's thought that it might relate to this practice of wrapping guinea worms around a stick to slowly extract them. So this is something that predates recorded history. Let's take a quick look at this organism. The adults live under the skin and the females will migrate down into the lower extremities, into the feet typically. Now, if you wade into water, the worm will poke out into the water to release its eggs. This is where you can grab onto it carefully and wrap it around a stick. But if that doesn't happen, the eggs are going to be released into the water. They're going to develop into larva and the larva are going to be consumed by a copepod. A copepod is a tiny little crustacean. And in fact, we talked about these guys a bit earlier. The larva will undergo development within the copepod and there's a few stages. And then that copepod can be consumed in water. The copepod will travel through the stomach. It'll be killed within the stomach. The worm will hatch out within the intestine. It'll burrow through the wall of the intestine and then move into the tissues underlying the skin. The guinea worm is restricted to tropical and subtropical regions, but the copepod is quite fascinating. It's found all around the world. We have them here in Canada. You can find them in ponds and rivers and so on. They form the basis of many, many food chains in the ocean and so on. So I don't want them to get a bad rap. They have these uh, appendages, these antennae at the front that they use to swim with, and they have one eye 
right in the middle of their head, and they were, of course, the inspiration for plankton. You don't want to get guinea worms. They can cause a lot of damage to your tissues, and they're very painful, especially when it comes to trying to remove them. So how do you prevent the spread of guinea worms? Well, one of the easiest things to do is to ensure that you're not consuming copepods when you're drinking fresh water. These crustaceans are large enough to see with the naked eye and they can be filtered out quite readily. And there's a number of companies that have produced these straw devices that will allow people in infected areas, Africa for instance, to drink fresh water without also taking in copepods. One of the best known of these devices is known as the life straw. One more nematode. This is known as the filarial worm. Again, this is something that's found in the tropics mainly. And in this case, the human is the definitive host. We have male and female worms that live within lymphatic vessels. In this case, the worm is spread by the mosquito. So we have larval forms that live within the mosquito. The mosquito is therefore a biological vector. The lymphatic system collects interstitial fluid that wasn't reabsorbed by venules, and it returns that fluid back to the general circulation of the blood. If lymphatic vessels become damaged or blocked, that fluid cannot be recollected and that causes the tissues to swell. As the tissues swell, cells will divide and move into that area and we can get these very, very swollen patches of skin and it can cause very, very heartbreaking deformities within the extremities, especially the lower extremities. So this is a condition known as elephantiasis. There's a few ways that this can come about, but here we're seeing pooling of lymph and then the development of these very tough deposits of connective tissue within these swollen regions of the limbs. Areas where there's lots of lymphatic vessels are especially harmed by this condition. So here we've got some individuals that have extremely swollen scrotums because of this. And maybe you should just pretend you didn't see that one. Before we leave nematodes behind, let's take a quick look at a rather novel and somewhat controversial application of nematodes. As mentioned before, it's natural for vertebrates to have lots of parasites. And in much of the world, humans still have lots of parasites. That's not the case in developed countries. In developed countries, we also have very high incidences of autoimmune disorders and allergies. And some researchers think that the two are linked. Our immune system contains cells known as eosinophils, and eosinophils have the job of attacking multicellular parasites. Well, if you don't have any multicellular parasites, there's nothing for them to do. And it's thought that maybe as a result of that, they might attack your own cells. So there's been some interesting research where they've taken parasites and purposely introduced them into people that have autoimmune disorders to see if this alleviates, reduces those disorders. So for instance, whipworm, which is a parasite that lives within the wall of the colon has been used in these trials. It's a worm that isn't terribly problematic unless you have a huge infestation and it's something that's reasonably easy to control. And it's thought that there might be quite a few disorders, Crohn's disease, and even things like autism that might be related to this autoimmune problem and perhaps could be treated by purposely introducing parasites. We have one last worm to talk about, and I promise this is the last worm. The leeches. Leeches belong to a group known as Annelida. These are segmented roundworms. So they're roughly round in cross section, but unlike the nematodes, there are clearly defined segments. We also don't have a cuticle. Also within the Annelida, we have the earthworms, but of course, they're not problematic in any way. Historically, if you were sick, 
a quote unquote doctor might tell you that it was due to an unbalance in your fluids. Maybe you had bad blood and what they would do is they would attach leeches to you to draw out that bad blood. Now that's not done anymore, of course, but you can have, so I'm told, leech acupuncture. And that's what you're seeing on the right here. I'm not going to speak to the efficacy of that. Leeches have proven to be quite useful though to medicine. So if a leech bites you, it has these teeth like structures within its mouth. And what it does is it cuts a little hole in your skin and it drinks your blood. It doesn't want you to know that it's doing that. So it actually secretes a local anesthetic before it bites you. Now, once it bites you, it wants the blood to keep flowing. It doesn't want it to coagulate. So it also produces an anticoagulant. Medical researchers have isolated both of those compounds and they've proven to be rather useful. There's another use for leeches. Let's say that you accidentally cut off your finger and it needs to be reattached. Well, what they'll do is they'll stitch the finger back onto your hand and they'll do the best they can to stitch up the blood vessels, but they can't stitch up the tiny blood vessels. They can't repair capillary beds. What they might do is they might take a hungry leech and put it on the end of your finger and that will draw a lot more blood into the finger and that will ensure that while your finger is healing, there's lots of oxygenated blood getting to all the tissues and that will make repair of the capillary beds more likely. So there are several places now that will breed leeches, starve them, and then deliver these starving leeches to hospitals. Personally, I quite like leeches. I think they're quite beautiful, especially the way they swim through the water. Uh, and note that if you're watching leeches at a local beach, a lot of leeches are not actually blood suckers. There's quite a few that feed on tiny little crustaceans and so on. When I was a kid, I had a pet leech. Uh, I had it in an aquarium and what they'll do is they'll make a cocoon on the side of the glass and uh, the mothers take really good care of their little babies. There's some leeches that will carry the babies around on their stomach. Uh, anyway, I digress a bit. Okay, let's move into insects, lice. Lice live on the body, in the hair, or sometimes just within clothing. We have three distinct species that infect humans. So they are really, really dedicated to us. We have head lice, we have body lice, and we have pubic lice. And you can see that the pubic lice are quite a bit different. They're referred to as crabs commonly because they do kind of look like crabs. The head lice and the body lice are quite similar. So pubic lice will live on body hair, whereas head lice prefer the hair of the head. Body lice are kind of interesting in that they live in clothing. They will bite you and draw some blood. And then once they're done, instead of hanging on to a hair, they will scuttle off and live within the folds of the clothing. Body lice are quite uncommon now and they're becoming less and less common. Um, basically anyone who is hygienic and washing their clothes isn't going to have body lice. Just the act of washing clothing will kill them. And it's thought actually that body lice might go extinct, which is sad, maybe. Lice feed on blood. Body lice live in clothing, as I mentioned, and they'll lay their eggs in clothing. Head and pubic lice will cling to hair and also attach their eggs to hair. Head lice typically will crawl down to the neck and bite the neck and then retreat back into the hair, but that's not always the case. The eggs that are attached to the hair are known as nits, and they can be removed with a special fine tooth comb. I should also mention that pubic lice are not necessarily going to be found in the pubic region, although that's most likely where they're going to be found, but they can be found on other body hair. And in fact, it's not too uncommon to find them in men's beards. I'll let you think about how they might get transferred there. Okay, there are a lot of remedies when it comes to dealing with lice. Some of them are good, some not so good. 
I would recommend a medicated shampoo that will kill the lice. Mayonnaise is sometimes uh, toted as a good home remedy. You cover your head in mayonnaise and it drowns the lice. And actually that probably would work. It would take a little while and it would be rather stinky, but it might work. Uh, gasoline, which is a common, very old school treatment, uh, not so much. I would not recommend dousing your head in gasoline for, well, obvious reasons. There are some other insects that will lay eggs on or in us. Bot flies, for instance, will lay eggs in orifices or wounds on occasion. Those eggs hatch into maggots, so that is the larval form of the fly, and then that will feed on secretions. Now this is more common in livestock. It's something that's problematic for horses, for instance. If you're a hunter, it's not uncommon to find these maggots within the nasal cavities of deer and so on. But occasionally, uh, humans will get botfly maggots as well. You can see one being removed from under the eyelid here. I have a kind of gross story. Um, I knew this uh, person once, it was a graduate student, and he was studying entomology, which is the study of insects. The botfly, as you can see in the diagram there, is rather unusual. And he was traveling, and um, he came home from his travels with a botfly maggot living in a little cut in his arm. No, he didn't put it there, but he wasn't unhappy about it either. He wanted to hatch this thing out and have an adult botfly to add to his collection. And he treated it like a pet, basically. He covered his arm in saran wrap so that it wouldn't drown in the shower, etc., etc. Long story short, the, the maggot died and he was sad. Now I think about it, I have another gross story too. I knew another grad student, uh, grad students are weird, who was also fascinated by parasites and he managed to get himself a tapeworm. Um, he had a tapeworm in him. I'm not sure how he got that, but he actually kept all the proglottids. He kept them in little jars of alcohol and he kept track of them almost like you would keep track of your children, you know, measuring their height up against the door frame. He had all the proglottids whenever he passed them. Uh, and the story goes actually that he was on a flight somewhere. He had to visit the washroom. He didn't want to miss his proglottids. So he ordered a double vodka and well, yeah, anyway. Bed bugs are on the rise. And I don't think anyone has a great explanation for why this is. A century ago, they were problematic. They lessened for several decades, and now they're kind of making a resurgence. They feed on blood, and they can remain dormant for many, many months. So if you have like a hunting cabin or something like that, and you don't get up there very often, bed bugs will wait for you. They can wait it out. They can wait a long time to have a drink of blood. What they'll do is they'll drink human blood. They need that protein and nourishment to lay eggs. But if food's not available, they will leave the bed and typically they'll hide behind baseboards or in cabinets or something like that. So when people try to fumigate their bed and their sheets to get rid of them, it's not always successful because they may be hiding somewhere else in the room. The bites can be quite itchy. They can cause allergic reactions. One of the best ways to know if you have a bed bug problem is to look for spotting of blood on the sheets. There will be little drops of blood from where you were bit when you were sleeping. Fortunately though, it seems to be quite uncommon for them to transmit disease. The group arachnids contains spiders and scorpions and so on, but also mites, and mites can cause us issues. This is a mite known as scabies, and you're seeing it living in dead skin. This is a little microscopic creature that can burrow into the skin and can form tunnels beneath the skin. And you can see these as little red lines, usually around the wrists. They're not as bad as it might sound, although they also are going to produce feces that will be deposited in those little tunnels and that can cause allergic reactions in many people. Here you're seeing the effects of scabies. Again, they quite commonly will infect the wrist. They tunnel through the skin. They can cause 
infection as well by other bacteria potentially, there can be scabbing and potentially scarring that results from this as well. Mange in pets is caused by similar mites and sometimes those mites can be transferred from pets to humans, although they tend not to live quite as long in humans. They're not the same species. Here's another mite that can cause us issues, something known as a chigger, very, very common in the southern US. In fact, I have my own gross story about this. Um, when I was doing my PhD research, I was down collecting reptiles in Oklahoma and I was out in some tall grass. And what these little mites do is the females will lay lots of eggs. And the little larvae, when they hatch, will crawl up to the top of a blade of grass and just wait there with their eight little legs waving, waiting for a host to grab onto. And I walked through one of these areas, I suppose, where there was probably many thousands of these little larvae just waiting to latch onto something. They latched onto me. And what they do is they crawl along your skin. They tend to head upwards uh, until they can't get any further. So they actually ended up crawling up to my belt line and then burrowing into my skin. They also go for your crotch and armpits. It's not terribly nice. They burrow into the skin, but then they die because you're not an appropriate host. So in this case, humans are accidental hosts again. But you do have an allergic reaction to this, and that causes welts like the one you see here. So I had lots and lots of welts all over my body. It was a very, very itchy experience. Next, we have dust mites. Dust mites are very common. They'll live within your bedding. They'll live within your carpeting and so on. And they're feeding on dust. About 50% of the dust in your house is dead skin, which is kind of a gross thought, but they like this stuff. They gobble it up. They're not infectious. They're not parasitic but they do molt and those molts may be floating around in the air. Their feces may also be floating around in the air. And in some people that causes allergic reactions. Other people have no reaction whatsoever. Some insects can be very important vectors of disease. They can transfer bacteria, for instance, or viruses from one host to another. And we will talk about those insects again when we talk about epidemiology, so stay tuned for that. And I'll leave you with one last interesting use of insects. Maggots are the larval form of flies. So just like a caterpillar is the larval form of a butterfly, maggots develop into flies. And there have been a number of studies that have used maggots to clean up necrotic tissue, dead tissue. Uh, one really interesting one was looking at people who had diabetes and had chronic wounds that weren't healing. Remember, in these wounds, we can get biofilms forming that are difficult to deal with. Throw a few maggots into that wound. They tend to leave the healthy tissue alone because it's kind of hard for them to break down. They'll go after the biofilm and they'll go after the dead, decaying necrotic tissue. So an interesting application of insects here for sure. Finally, our concepts. Parasitology is the study of parasitic organisms. Remember that a parasite is an organism that's living on or in another organism and causing it harm. So that would cover bacteria and viruses and so on, but usually when people use the term parasitology, they're using it in reference to parasitic eukaryotes. Parasites can be external or internal, and the internal parasites quite often have complex life cycles. External parasites are sometimes vectors. They serve as hosts for pathogens, and they can transfer pathogens from one host to the next. And we will, of course, come back to that. Parasites are the norm in nature, and parasites are still very common in a lot of developing human communities. The fact that we don't have parasites in developed countries is unusual, and it may have resulted in some autoimmune disorders.
Most parasites do not kill their host. The goal of a parasite is to stick around and feed off of that resource for as long as possible. And for that reason, a lot of mild parasite infections are asymptomatic. Now, I was going to include a lot of really gross videos, but I think I'm gonna leave that and I'll let you cruise YouTube at your own discretion. Believe me, you will find them. Here's our terminology list. It's not that bad, although I do realize there are quite a few life cycles to learn. I've tried to summarize the different organisms that we've looked at, and we will come back to some of these again when we look at infections of specific body systems. And finally, some study questions to share with your family and closest friends.